Welcome back to Building Brand Advocacy. My name is Paul Archer and I'm stoked to be joined by Rich Chappell. Now, Rich is an absolute guru of growth. Now, he has been a part of growing three unicorns. So he's their former head of marketing at Play.com. He was founder and CEO at THG Ingenuity. So that's the Huck Group, if anyone knows them. And he was CMO of a little brand called Gymshark. Uh, now kind of consulting and working with tons of D2C brands. What he doesn't know about D2C doesn't exist um, it's been 20 years now, you've been in the industry, you like, you're right, you've got your finger on the pulse of everything that's happened from when you started your career to what's going right now. How has it evolved? What's changed in that time? Uh, that's a great question, Paul, and welcome and hello, everyone. Uh, what's changed? And I, I think I'm going to pivot the question, if that's all right, if I've got permission to do that. I'm going to start with what hasn't changed. Um, so the thing that I've, uh, um, I suppose, that has been constant, I, a couple of things really that come to mind. I suppose successful brands, in my view, are the ones that really obsess about their their customers or their target audience or both. You know, target audiences and customers are a bit of a vent because, you know, the, the target audiences are the ones you you want to hunt and get to, to come and consume your products or service. And obviously customers are the ones that are either actively doing so um, either very frequently, hopefully, or maybe you're in their first purchase in, in the nursery or the kindergarten of your relationship with them. Um, customer obsession in terms of understanding what the features and benefits of your product do for them, both rationally and emotionally. But also one of the things I think that, that, that really exceptional brands do is go slightly deeper into the subconscious and think about the sort of the fast thinking brains of consumers around perhaps status and, and other things, um, which we can, I'm sure we'll bump into a little bit around our, our further conversation. So the, that, that hasn't changed. Also, I think the requirement for for brands, if you, and again, if you're a retail brand that's selling, let's say, others like a department store, or you're a direct-to-consumer brand, and you know you're you're getting uh, products made in manufacturing somewhere, and you're selling them direct over the internet via Shopify or Amazon or wherever, um, the thing that you need to do is obviously create the awareness in the first place. And when I'm talking to friends and family about uh, marketing and trying to deconstruct it, I often talk about you know the the concept is a bit like you know dating to getting married so you know that first date you've got to got to be out there you've got to create a, the brilliant first impression you've got to create an emotional connection to consumers and then i suppose depending on what you sell it might be a sort of a very impulsive type of product that allows you to with a low let's say a low low average order value typically and something like a little luxury you might be able to get the second and third date or even straight to marriage very quickly if you're selling things and we do work with um you know brands in the let's say sofa and floor and flooring space home home improvement that sales cycle or marriage dating to marriage plan can take um maybe 8 12 weeks from people sort of you know coming to the, into the market considering buying down to, to conversion so um that's around planning and i suppose trying to deconstruct that journey through those you know first date second date fifth date you know to to purchase and i think one of the things that um, has is constant that, that that requirement and understanding is needed. You know, twenty years ago, ten years ago, now, and I and I, I guess all the way into the future, and perhaps even with a, a more AI supportive future, that that concept of you know um, that journey is absolutely key. I think the things that that have changed um, over the time, I suppose, as I, I started at Play.com in sort of two thousand and four. Paid search was in its infancy. Sort of online display advertising was was going where you put banners over over websites and paid on a you know a tenancy basis. There was a bit of affiliate marketing, obviously um, created particularly from the Amazon program and things like that, that. That what those guys did. But other than that, there really wasn't very much other digital marketing you could do um, in terms of I suppose creating that first date. You know that 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 first encounter. Um, and back then we would deploy and use uh, more traditional offline media to support those paid um, uh, elements we were doing. So lots of press, lots of out of home, lots of um, TV. And again, we would do that on a quite scrappy, we used to call it snatch basis. So we do, you know, lots of last minute deals. We do things like where we you know, speak to out of home advertisers and say, look, can we, we'll always have artwork ready to go. If you can let us any know any cancellations or remnant space, we'll buy it much cheaper than you know, the, the premium market, et cetera. So we would do all of that good stuff. And, and effectively, how would we measure success? We came down to, and we and we still advise this now and throughout my whole career, you know, THG, the many brands there working across that and at Gymshark, actually setting a, a fixed budget to acquire a customer. So we were much less ROAS focused, which is kind of a piece of terminology in my view that's come out of the meta and particularly the meta world of sort of, you know, campaign optimization, which can be useful. But 
actually at the end of the month or the week, how much cash has gone out from the marketing team. And that can include, you know, everything from brand content production, the whole lot, what's been your you know cost and then how many new customers have you acquired, you know, divide those. And, you know, can you imagine, can you, can you believe actually back at play.com sort of 15 uh, years back or so we had a five pound cost per or CAC cost per acquisition, new acquisition <laughs> budget, which was achieved. And that we were, and we were doing TV and press and radio and all those other, other good stuff along that, you know, very, in a very, I suppose, quite smart, brave way. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that is, that is true. And I think what happened over, Perhaps you know with um, the platforms like Meta or Facebook when it started, and and even more recently as you know through into Instagram and TikTok, those guys are very, very skilled at the moment in time at creating the attention um, of uh, you know or actually gaining the attention of uh, of consumers and effectively the target audience. And obviously, pre iOS fourteen, attention was relatively cheap when you looked at how much it cost to appear, and also targeting and the accuracy of that. So if we're using our dating analogy, you know I could think. I know, you know, which type of uh, target audiences I'm usually successful with. I can, you know, target my message and my first date message or my fifth date message to that to that individual pretty accurately. So it's now the, that's the TikTok. Or it's the um, uh, completely blank. <laughs> oh, I just cut it out. Sorry, uh, <laughs> the Tinder. <laughs> so it's the Tinder of uh, of buying. So Meta and highly targeted ads, the equivalent of Tinder, Match.com, where you're getting exactly into your niche. Yeah. And you kind of lose maybe some of the art of marketing and brand building because it's completely just, yeah and right i think what's side. happened sort of post ios 14 and this, i'm sure your listeners have probably started to bump into this type of um content from thought leaders in the space is is actually content and what you say starts to become the differentiator now when you are less able to um i suppose measure directly um and have that more scientific analytical approach and again it reminds me you think about Go back even to sort of the 80s and 90s when perhaps I was growing up as if, you know, um, sort of the, the, the TV ads that I'm sure we all could watch again because we were watching linear TV. You know, the ones that stood out were the ones that were really entertaining or useful. And, you know, and that's kind of where we, we can come back to, you know, entertaining or useful ads that stand out are the ones irrespective perhaps of your accuracy in targeting, the ones that can capture that recall and get into the... I suppose into the consciousness and the subconsciousness of the consumers so when they do if they do enter the market they're like okay I remember that brand because X Y Z. So I think if that feels like there's a lots of has evolved but there's a circularity to it. And um, when we were catching up before you press record, you know we've got a couple of clients at the moment who are now at a stage where they've got you know and these are these are brands that I'll give you a sense of you know five, 10, 20 million turnover annually. So they're not hundreds of millions of turnover brands. Who are starting to put budgets back into offline media for that mid to upper funnel first second third dating kind of activity so, so you know again because when you look at it on a cpm basis meta versus out of home meta versus tv tiktok um it, it's very comparable and potentially even cheaper um what i find really interesting about it is again maybe to stretch the analogy a little bit but like it, it, the quality of the customers you're getting in as well is probably proportionate to the work that you do up front and so yeah. probably if you meet someone at three o'clock in the morning and get married the next day in vegas the probably longevity <laughs> of that relationship may not be quite the same as one who'd had a very comprehensive dating process moved in met the parents and <laughs> and went on from yeah there yeah I, yeah and i suppose what what you do get what the, i suppose one of the benefits still of a direct to consumer, um, I suppose, proposition within your sales channel mix. Because again, you know, more now than ever, brands can look at marketplace, Amazon, or other marketplaces that exist. You've got when I say marketplaces, that can extend to TikTok shop or Pinterest. There's, there's all places again that, we, that can create that. The D 2 C element obviously gives you that customer ownership and the ability to measure that quality. So there's something I think still quite defensible or strategically valuable in having D to C as part of your sales mix, right? Because of the nature of that first party data ownership, it's still super valuable. And that will always be yours as the brand. You know, if you formed a contract with that individual to, you know, to sell and supply a service, that will allow you to really measure that quality post-purchase. So we, yeah, again, we do a lot of work um, in our consulting world where we actually, when we first meet a brand, if they engage us, we, we conduct a quite thorough recency frequency monetary value analysis of that business. Some of them are really good and have got relatively, I say, uh, comprehensive sort of last click data. And again, the last click is only like, well, I know the last date before you got married. I don't know that first one. But again, you can start to measure quality. Um, 
And even now, post iOS 14, we find that our, um, I suppose, scoring of customers can allow us to feed lookalike features or lookalike tools in existing platforms. And actually, we can usually beat the, you know, their, their algorithms a little in terms of their own lookalike um, um, processes that where they've got a pixel or a tag on a site, we can usually squeak that a bit more and get, get a bit more out of it using this process. So yeah, that's that's very good. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Uh, obviously, man, um, as we know, I suppose the the thing that probably also jumps out as the as the one of the greatest changes is that is the number of channels marketing channels available to a a brand or a marketing team to to use is there are, there are effectively hundreds and again best practice tells you that you should make content exclusively for each channel so i think that's one of the other challenges that a lot of brands have is like you know they've got limited budgets limited time and resources how do you create 80 output files for for a campaign versus perhaps again wind the clock back 20 years you'd have four or five output files right for a campaign so that's that's probably one of the biggest challenges how do you scale content and things like that and that's that's actually something which we're seeing across the board with with jewel is that one of the biggest pain points that customers are seeing is is content and ugc is a hot topic and like back in 2016 it was a big thing and then it sort of died out a little bit because it was pretty hard to manage now it's ugc 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 and i think so much a part of that is because if someone else is creating it in TikTok native format, which in its essence is a user generated platform, as with all yeah. the other social media, mm -hmm. it means that you, you don't have to do it. And it's almost tailored to the way it needs to be there. So it's kind of creating efficiencies, but also creating like much more optimized content. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And obviously, and what will be interesting, I suppose, as we go forward, it, you know, in, into 2024 and beyond is looking at how, you know, the incredible advancement of AI, particularly in creative, is going to help do some of that work, I suppose, because I, I don't know about like you, but, you know, fall down the TikTok algorithm rabbit hole watching the uh, the beta on Photoshop around that, you know, generative <laughs> mapping. And you can imagine, can't you probably, again, look, here's my core proposition, but I need a different format, I need a different size. Can you do some extra work? I, I think it's going to be a real um yeah i suppose a shift in terms of productivity if you've still got humans creating and making brilliant prompts and inputs and the, the concepts and then having you know those type of tools help you then generate more variants and sort of tweaks on those variants that are suitable for each uh, each platform so you can see there's probably a an element where that even could be self-fulfilling and learning um there was a platform that i saw uh, a year or so back called pencil which was effectively does this creatively so you set your brand assets into it it will create the ad. It will actually connect into the advertising platform, see which ad versions work better, and actually learn. It's you know, gener you know, uh, a reinforced learning model, and actually then removing the human from this granular you know need to tweak output and things like that. So yeah, there's, there's lots of good stuff coming there. Wow, yeah, that sounds fascinating. And so, like, so you talked about it. It's almost like the um, the job of building a brand has. Well, it hasn't changed. It's been exactly the same as it was, as it always is. But it's almost like people got slightly lost along the way. You know, the idea of going direct to consumer, therefore we can track everyone who comes in, therefore we must be able to track everything, therefore we'll just spend all, my, all our money on trackable activities like meta ads, yeah. et cetera. And, and where it was effectively, perhaps you could argue that the platforms were lost leading themselves to make that aware, you know, the access to those consumers relatively cheap. For, for for brands as well you know compared to other channels because they wanted to get the market share they wanted the advertising dollars away from traditional channels right so they made it not only was it relatively accurate it was actually it fe effectively felt subsidized uh, you know I've asked, so, yeah. I've asked this question actually before on the pod but do you feel that younger brand builders who are kind of coming have come up since 2015 2016 that era yeah. purely really about you know optimize direct consumer and pay for customer acquisition do you think that they are lacking in a skill set? And, and if they are, how can they go about to skill themselves up? Yeah, I think there is probably an element of, the, of, of lacking because, the, yeah, the pattern recognition that they've had as individuals, if you, you know, if you started a brand in the last five years, means that you won't have had a conversation, as you say, to, you know, what do we put on an out-of-home poster? If we were going to have a 30-second TV spot with a bit of production value, what would we put in it? Um, so there is that. And I think one of the elements that we that we've, find and again you know growth foundation we've got a few different propositions here one of them is the consulting side which i i lead and do a lot of work on but we've got a, a talent business here do a lot of recruitment for for, for, for our for our brands because obviously once you say hey this is what you need to do they're like well we need some people so we help them find the right type of talent and actually we have we have a lot of creative briefs where when we look at a business you can see actually that 
kind of let's say more traditional advertising agency led sort of creative direction and ideation is it can be sort of under index in a direct to consumer brand but actually i suppose the ones that seem to sort of again get through some of the inflection points of growth is where you have a creative um founder usually it's a you know a creative visionary or one of those individuals that perhaps in a different life may have been a creative director at a, at a traditional ad agency it's someone who can come up with a it's that you know that moment of creating an idea around they've got deep understanding of who the target audience is again coming back to that point of i and perhaps because they were the target audience themselves they are the consumer they created the products in the first place because they couldn't find it it didn't exist and often so that's that's that you know moment to think well actually i'm going to go ahead and do it and I'm, i've got and i because of that deep understanding i can now ideate and create concepts that connect to those consumers and i think when you look at um a lot of i suppose brand and marketing teams if you have founders that aren't inputting that way or um you know that, that don't come from that point of view yeah they do tend to under index on that sort of more creative emotional skill set around how do i create a feeling with a customer and not just a a rational benefits message you know that that's a and i think if you look again sort of there's a, some brilliant case studies aren't there like you know in the 80s of apple versus ipm whereas apple sort of went down the overtly emotional sort of connection element and you can see you know the ibm route was rational and features of here's you know here's the processing power and actually for for the mass market people are like, i don't care about the power i just want it to do what i want it to do and i want to want to feel something you know there was a, that status symbol of having an apple product so um, yeah, that that does tend to under index a bit, Paul. Yeah, yeah, it's quite quite an interesting sort of shift that's going on with regards to like the great thing about all these D to C brands, of which there are far more than there's ever been ever before, and however many million of them are just on Shopify alone. Like it's it's so easy to start a brand now, so easy to drop ship. It's, you know, a lot of these yeah. brands are coming from nowhere. Um, you know, we'll we'll certainly get to Gymshark, a perfect example of a of a brand start started by someone with a really deep niche and a passion for what they were doing. Do you find that we I mean, talked about that? There's that lack of that agency creativity that you know a lot of the big agencies still spend most get most of their time working with a you know the Unilevers of the world, the the uh, particularly yeah. the PNGs. When you're selling a product to the mass market, when there's no niche, you can't just be like, well, I buy mayonnaise, so uh, I must know how to yeah. sell mayonnaise to it. But like when you've got a Gymshark, or if you're looking at um, a particular niche area, do you find that it would matter as much that they don't have that creative because they just intuitively just know the buyer in a way that's just instinctive? They just know what they should write. Yeah, I think knowing the buyer is, and again, obsessing about your your, your target audience and consumer is is needed, irrespective of perhaps your product or service and then obviously there's a different I suppose uh element to bring into that to make it a, a matrix or a, put it on a, <laughs> on a on an axis is like that uh element are you a very unique product in a very like either in a niche or a far, first mover so do you have to act and perhaps educate consumers that you exist and the reason that you exist and um or if you look at like the Gymshark examples and many others actually there were there were products that you could argue were maybe just good enough to wear when you were resistance or weight training in the gym. But obviously for Ben, who was a deep subject matter expert in that place or had a need for a, a better product there, it wasn't being serviced by the likes of the Nikes or Adidas or Under Armour or others. And there was like, hang on, there's an opportunity here to build a product that I'm looking for. And, 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 and actually I probably don't have to educate people what fitness clothing is, right? But I'm gonna now talk to you and spend our time about why our product, you know, and, um, and a community of people around it First of all, I suppose they're choosing to use you know weights and, and weight training to, to get fitter and improve their lives, but also why our products do a job of actually satisfying the need, both rationally, which you'd argue is covering yourself when you're training to some degree. Um, um, but also it's again, you know, apparel is a brilliant example of this, of what it says about you when you are training, you know, it's worn as a, a badge of honor or, uh, you know, um, those things in particular are really interesting. And I suppose that's another dynamic, isn't it? Is like if the product is worn and seen, um, like a watch, a car, clothing, sunglasses, um, things that are consumed are, are, are a really interesting one. Like you talk about like the PNG ones, you know, like um, like food and beverage, I suppose. Like how do you bring some of that stuff to life when you're drinking, consuming or applying beauty and things like that on your on your skin? So a bit of a different, difficult mix. But I think, come back to that point, you know, do you really truly understand the, 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 yeah, the, the I suppose the way that we deconstruct this when we talk to a brand is looking at what are the, those, the, the benefits that the features of the product bring 
rationally and emotionally and also consciously and subconsciously if we can and often we'll bring a consumer psychologist along to our clients as well to really get under the skin of what's really going on both you know those subconscious behaviors even that some customers wouldn't admit and we've got an example of maybe bringing that to life with Gymshark but also really importantly and a lot of brands don't spend enough time doing this is um is the anxieties and the reasons you don't buy and often that becomes much more overt as a consumer when you get close to the point of purchase. So, you know, our, our dating marriage analogy, <laughs> d- dating is OK for a bit. But when you actually say, will you get married? Will you do? Often, usually it's the anxieties of the reasons why you wouldn't start to, you know, um, overtake the, the, the benefits of the product. And great brands, again, do good work in the low funnel, on site, in their checkout basket area to really suppress that. Um and I'll, give, I'll, bring a, I'll bring an example to life, hopefully. So we, we did a work a year or two back with an amazing brand called Rurock, who are a ski uh, helmet and motorcycle helmet brand. Really awesome. And uh, one of the things that we were interested to testing in the checkout was thinking about uh, this is a, like a $500 purchase for a new brand. Obviously, safety is a really key thing. You're going to wear a crash helmet when you're motorcycling. It's really important. But also the purpose of the brand was around, it wasn't like, you know, helmets for kind of functional commuting these this brand was all about the freedom that riding and skiing gives you that moment of actually protecting you do while you do pretty crazy stuff so if you're going to jump off mountains or go dirt bike you know dirt biking or you're going to ride across the you know the a highway in the us you want to look badass you want to do crazy stuff but know you're safe so that was kind of the, the brand so we tested in the checkout um a couple of things which was actually amplifying all the safety criteria that you know um, returns were easy if it wasn't going to fit you that there's a secure checkout all those other things and we did that kind of visually at the top of the checkout which is usually an area most people don't spend a lot or enough time on in my view we're obsessed about spending more time at the checkout and what you can do there visually and um, we also tried just a picture of like a badass dude um with riding a harley across a desert just looking awesome at that checkout moment and that was the one that won the a b test so we had a just a, a visual so again there's the customers coming down we're actually we saw anxiety suppression is important. We put some messages at the bottom, but it was still that dreaming of that's me at the weekend, getting on the bike, disappearing, leaving work and all my troubles behind me. And that had a quite material uplift in our sort of, you know, cart to check out to order completion rates. So that very last, you know, let's get married moment. Um, and again, a lot of brands don't spend enough time on that. They they will play around with like we were talking about, you know, home pages and collection pages when one or two image cheeks or copy t- tweaks in the checkout can have um, even a greater effect on your conversion rate than further up in date one or date two. And, and how are you getting? How are you getting that knowledge that you thought? You know what? Let's drop a picture of a dude in the Harley here, and or let's put the safety things. Were you doing customer interviews? Were you? You just you did it. You did a hundred different tests, and this one came out out right. Where did it? Well, it yeah, I mean, it it comes from again. I suppose yeah, defining who the customer is. You know, the day in the life of what do they use the product from? And there was an element of a bit of qual, um, but it wasn't like a big, um, you know, I suppose fancy or expensive panel group, anything else. We were using, I think, a survey monkey or some Google forms, like, what do you ride? When do you ride? What do you ride it for? You know, and the quick, quick, pretty quickly, I suppose the hypothesis of perhaps the founders of the brand would be, yeah, we're here for kind of, we're not around commuting, we're not around that. And I was interested to say, well, that's actually true. Do we actually, are people using the helmets mainly for commuting or, you know, are they out? And I suppose some of that, the hypothesis of the founding team were very much kind of, um, I suppose ratified and confirmed by that relatively, you know, say fast, quick and dirty, you know, work. And then we thought, well, actually, look, if we did just an A/B test, and it was really around coming down to, well, let's just a, you know, the A test would have been anxiety suppression. So, what are the things we believe make our customers anxious? And we asked them. Right, it was like returns, safety, um, size and fit were a massive one. Um, and then the B would have been right what are the features and benefits right well you know I, I wear this product because i think it makes me look wicked when i'm riding and I, and i'm and i feel safe while i'm doing some crazy stuff on my bike or on my skis so we're like well we could show some pictures of that and amplify that that need and then on the anxiety thing and we, we do this again with a few other clients particularly where sizing is a an anxiety point like something like um you know like you get like a chat widget on your site when you when you when you uh turn up at a site you get hey how can i help you today might pop up on the bottom left hand corner that's the standard boilerplate message that comes from let's say you know um from zendesk or whoever who's powering your little chat widget well we we would test things like adding some copy which might say um you know 97 percent of our customers think our size is brilliant full stop 
how can I help you today? Yeah. So, you, you know, just little, and those kind of things can really pop up, pop all over the place um, on the site where you're just amplifying features and benefits, suppressing anxiety. So that's a key, key point to that. And that's, again, I think great marketers and great brands really pay close attention to that across the funnel. And obviously, I think, again, if you to sort of summarize, typically mid and upper funnel, it's about the benefits. It's all about, you know, having, bringing that up as much as possible. And then as you get closer and move towards conversion, probably is bringing the uh, the anxiety messaging up larger in that um, as you get, as you go down. I love that. And, you know, a lot of it is social proof. You know, we are just monkeys. Big part of that, yeah. Like, looking at other monkeys and seeing what they're doing before we make a decision whether to jump off a thing or not um and you can just see that if you simplify it down to actually let's not think about these these people if a lot of people get quite caught up in their brand thinking well they must be thinking this and they're doing this and they're this and this and this and actually at the end of the day they're probably you probably aren't that kind of brand that has like a lot of belonging in a sense that they they kind of have in it so if you you take like a Gymshark, for example, like there's, there are those people that they build for, but you know, there is, you can't build a multi-billion dollar brand just building for your niche. At one point you kind of start moving uh, across from there. Yeah. And th there's an interesting tension in that because usually otherwise I've maybe thrown that on a whiteboard a few times. I'm sure I've got a slide for it, but you've got like the, the predefined target audience for the brand itself. So let's use the Gymshark example, 16 to 24 year old, uh, men and women or actually all genders or um, of those things but I think there was an element again in my time that had probably already started their sort of gym journey they were in the gym already they may not have been overtly or exclusively using weights and resistance training but they would already have made a decision to use the gym to perhaps improve their life improve their fitness improve the look and all that kind of stuff right um, and we made it actually one of the members one of the questions, first questions I ever asked Ben was like you know are we a youth brand forever or are we going to get older with our um, as you get older, Ben, you know, as our sort of number one customer, you know, and it was very much a proactive decision to stay youthful forever. But actually what's interesting, I suppose, and lucky for a youthful clothing brand is that when you go, if you imagine that's the, the center of your target, bullseye target, if you put that on a, on, a, on a slide, the next layer out is probably the 25 to 35 year olds who, and likewise, the next layer out, 35 to 45, who actually are in the gym and else, and actually probably still wish they were 25 and had a body and a physique and a metabolism of a 25 year old as I do. And you yeah. gravitate towards what the brand stands for in terms of that youthful energy and motivation. And, and I suppose actually for a brand, it might mean that you, in terms of like the influencers or the UGC that you, I suppose, help, you know, users create, you're going to, you're going to probably positively discriminate younger consumers but actually then for the marketing team you've got permission to let's say again you know through through digital platforms or through the the, the channels that you target and use you can broaden that out to a, well i'm happy to do just adults or 16 to 44 right and put those youthful um you know uh, individuals in the content that, that we show older people and that can be very effective so we'd have a very different kind of that then or that target was something we we, we looked at quite a bit at gymshark in terms of uh, and, and actually in other brands is like the, the core target you know that golden customer um that the brand creates stories for and actually creates first dates for what's the best first or second date we could create but then you know there's a group of individuals on the outside that go actually i quite like that first date i'm interested in this you've, you've connected with me um i'm interested yeah so um yeah that that it's definitely a good way to think of it like that you don't have to be exclusively just a, that that center circle yeah i like that and i think that to sort of slightly stretch that analogy again um we look at it from a b2b perspective as well a lot of people just expect people to buy or right away and you've got to know that most purchases don't happen because i'm scrolling instagram i see an ad boom i buy it a few of those like during so, yeah, those little, yeah and, and again maybe <laughs> um and, and there is definitely a, a price elasticity or sensitivity to that you know i say you know um under 100 pounds but even under under 50 right those things that little luxuries 10 20 30 40 pounds that has a short buying cycle and again you can see it in the analytics can't you know what's the time lag from you know first visit to purchase and you know we look at some of those lower aov brands that we work with and 90 percent of their transactions happen on day zero so it is first or second visit on the same day again you look at sofa brand or flooring like it's you no know, the time lag can be weeks and weeks and even yeah. actually what's really interesting because we've, we've got a tool called order rescue so i will plug that which is a checkout um conversion rate optimization tool um we we monitor time in checkout 
as well. And we've got, you know, some brands, uh, if we look at a, a beauty brand, for example, which may have the fastest checkout is something like two seconds, which is insane. Not quite sure even what platform you're on to be able to do that. <laughs> but the average is about three minutes. And then it's like this skewed curve. And there's some people, again, over, we look at, you know, you can obviously change the date range, but there are, there are one or two customers right on this long tail who have taken all week to check out. So they've loaded a checkout and literally maybe they're using it as a wish list. They put it in there, they get distracted. Mm-hmm. There can be other things, not only in your dating to marriage, actually at the very point you walk, you know, you're in the church now with a, you know, that kind of thing. It's like that can take a week or two or five, you know, as well. And that's a really interesting, I suppose, insight to think about, well, when do you fire, um, I suppose, basket reminder or abandon emails and things like that, you know, because um, that, that will probably be set for everyone. And actually there could be a, decent 50% of your customers that don't actually check out within the first hour or day. They actually take a bit longer. When I say check out, literally just in that very last page of the site can be a very long decay as well. And do, do you publish the benchmarks that you can see, you know, if you're sub 50 bucks or if you're beauty? Versus yeah, we're, four, we're starting like- to. So the tool we've been live with 30 merchants from everything from around sort of the low lower end of the size would be a sort of two, three million turnover up to a couple in our distribution curve of up in the hundreds of million. That's something we're planning on doing. We're in beta at the moment. When we get it into full production in in coming weeks, we'll be able to do that. And actually, we've got UCL, University College London, their data analytics lab is looking at all the, now we've got nearly 100 million data points from these checkouts and bringing those uh, product category, I suppose, benchmarks or insights to bear. Because even when you look at beauty and we've got a handful of, you know, maybe 10 beauty clients uh, similar, there's different behaviors even based on brands. So we're, we're trying to add that insight into that to see actually yeah, is, is there some i suppose action and tactics that come from this insight based on the category and so yeah we definitely will be doing more on publishing that so keep an eye out on my linkedin for that yeah i look forward to that and so let's let's kind of get to you sort of talked about the really neat the very narrow focus that you had with gymshark like there have been many athletic wear brands before there have been many since but there have not been many like Gymshark what what was it what is it that makes them such a phenomenal business uh well that's a good question I think um so like again probably a lot of businesses that tend to break through um timing is um often key you know that they hit the wave of Instagram rising very quickly and YouTube um uh, that's one component really hard work and determination by the founding team and and bravery to get going and do it and I'm sure you if you've listened to any of Ben's content or others that you know I think it was his seventh or fifth business or whatever right so it's again that element of resilience and standing up again when things don't succeed try again and actually pivoting it from it was a drop ship sports nutrition brand initially pivoting it into you know the merchandise and they started to spot hang on a second we seem to be selling more t-shirts than we are the nutrition we're selling Mm -hmm. there's something interested in that and a little signal um but again coming back to so what happened i suppose what happened there was an element of again ben and the founding team i suppose having that just native and organic understanding of what the consumer wanted and that brand in particular i think um was built for you know in the early days very much around individuals that wanted to train very comfortably but also kind of wear a brand in that area of the gym that was kind of a badge of honor it showed off all of the hard work the sweat the grit the tears the determination and resilience of training so you know the brands it was quite fitted it would show off your shoulders and sort of accentuate certain parts of your body I'd also go to say and have a, a point of view personally it was very attractive to the more extrovert kind of gym goers so ones that like you know training in front of the mirror they like to you know they like attention they're the peacocks in the gym whereas i think when i meet people either when i was there or you know subsequently that say it's not a brand for me it's usually because perhaps they're more introvert they're a personal you know get in put your headphones on and train in in, a, in personalized uh, personal isolation and there's no right or wrong on either but i suppose the net the nature of us being able to use content and particularly if you think about instagram in the early days it was very much about you know you hear the term instaglam it was about showing i suppose the world the best version of yourself so there's a sort of few sort of stars aligning here where people were gravitating to hey i want to look better i want to be able to you know genuinely put beautiful pictures of myself and things you know in a place where my friends and family can see them and my you know and and more um extended network so the brand kind of hit that in, in in the right time and acted on it. And then I suppose having and deconstructing that offer architecture of the features and benefits of this product, like rationally, again, it covers me while I'm training, but also it does the emotional thing of it makes 
be more confident because I'm really proud of how I look when I look at myself or when other people look at me in the gym. That is the thing that really resonated with the consumer, I think. And uh, and again, building a community of, I suppose, influencers that were creating content and social proof that were able to use their um, audiences and followers, but also then amplify that through boosting that content to others was kind of, you know, you'd see it and go, actually, that, that I want to be that person. I, you know, I strive, I have this ambition of um, having that life and having that body and having that that attention. And again, you, we could probably spend a bit of time, you know, deconstructing is that healthy or not healthy, but either way, it, it that you know, that's for me what it is. Uh, so th there's an element of true understanding of the, um, the consumer and their needs. So we've discussed that quite a bit already, but let's not forget some of the other points, which was, um, organizationally making sure that all the kind of let's say the boring stuff like finance and ops and tech and the enabling function of the business kept up with the demand so you know i was in a lucky position when i met them initially as a as she as a consultant looking from the outside not in the weeds of the tactical execution of that business to say if we're going to carry on in this trajectory we need to start to build these other you know foundations to support this as it grows um so there was one point there and making sure we were always sort of you know three six twelve months ahead in terms of thinking about the the delivery of the promise we make customers how do we do that and make sure we keep up with things um and i think also the other point was um and we mentioned it in our kind of briefing notes was the strategic clarity so meeting the the brand like a lot of founders you have a you, i suppose the, the benefit of being a, let's say a director a shareholder or a founder of a business is that you have choice you have choice to be able to create new products and services actually target new consumers open new countries and open new sales channels. And there's quite often when we meet them, more often than not, sort of a sweet shop effect of paral paralyzed by choice or trying to do them all at once. So either we find founders or businesses that are like paralyzed and don't know which ones to act on next. So is it, a, should we go for a new country, a new sales channel? Or, or it's perhaps the, the, the business decided to go for all of them. And actually they've not then really resourced and thought about the tactical implication of trying to open up every country, every sales channel and all those kind of things, right? So there was an element of working through with the, the founding team and the guys, the senior management team there around, you know, deconstructing and actually positively discriminating things we could do and saying, let's do less better. So, for example, you know, you looked at that business when I joined it, a very, very small percentage of its sales went to the US compared to the UK initially. And we were like, this is a big market. Um, here's an opportunity. So perhaps should we just put all of our proactive energy on growing that and then we can get to another market later on in a year or two, or we could go and open another product or, you know, another thing later on. So that, that was really clear. Uh, and often for, again, sort of for founders perhaps is that I'm going to sort of stereotype a bit here and generalize. They might have, the nature is they've got shorter attention spans. They're usually really highly productive, high EQ, high IQ, and they get bored quickly. Right. Um, and that also means that seeing the same product or offer, you know, or message out to consumers over and over again for a period of time can be frustrating. And you actually have to say, look, you've only you've only spoken to 400,000 customers so far, and maybe we've reached a million consumers, but there are, let's say, 800 million consumers in our target audience. And actually, our core hero product that's got us going is is not wrong. It's not broken. You know, if it's not broke. Don't fix it. So it's all almost like slowing down to go faster um, is the strategy. You see, yeah, definitely see that a lot with the uh, brands that haven't quite nailed the one product that is their hero product that are already releasing a second product and a third product. Then it's like, if you need to get that word of mouth piece that is just firing up, if the product is working initially, then obviously that's like, that's a, if it's not working, then obviously you look at other things, find that product market fit. But if you've got it, it's often uncomfortably long. You have to stick with that before you start diversifying. Yeah. And I think there's also, you know, you can get much more granular in that initial product or offer in terms of imagine, you know, that sort of deconstruction of the dating to marriage and post marriage in terms of onset, you know, you can really deconstruct that to optimize that first hero product much more before going too wide uh, and, and launching others. Yeah. So that's a, that's a real key one, I think. And so do you think like the, we're kind of looking at that niche, they nailed into that niche, the sort of the extroverts, like kind of really tapping into almost a vanity vein which was very much sort of frowned upon but i think now with instagram do you, do you think that that community found themselves as like, i like looking at myself in the mirror whilst i work out you like looking at yourself in the mirror while i work out we can be friends is that what's happened and they just weren't served by anyone else possibly i think actually there's an element in and i, I suppose i believe this personally that there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good 
And there's nothing wrong to, to want to look at yourself or look at other people either. And I think where the community element sort of perhaps resonated or connected, and again, this comes from me speaking with a bit of distance now and both in time and, you know, I'm away from the business tactically quite significantly. So it, but sort of in reflection, it feels as though there are, you know, there will be a bunch of humans that are kind of have a, a DNA or a psychological makeup that's similar. There's again, it, and we would see this, you know, when we would see a queue for one of the pop-up stores and you'd see, here's someone that's come from Oxford and someone's flown in from Paris and they're next to each other and they've got, you open the contents of their handbag. We would do this actually, we're going, oh, what's in your bag? You know, to try to talk, not in a weird way. We'd be like, who are you? What, you know, and you'd find they've got the same brands of makeup. They've got the same shoes on. Uh, they've got the same, you know, uh, they're listening to the same music on their iPod. What's on the playlist? What have you been listening to? So it was like this sort of carbon copy almost, or kind of very similar individual that was positioned all over the world. And I think um, that's what the community did was that perhaps the, 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 let's say the influence of the creators with the greatest followers and engagement sort of stood as spokespeople for the people who wanted to live their lives like that. And I think, um, yeah, you could definitely argue that is there, um, does that put pressure on people to sort of conform potentially, but I don't think it does in any other way in any other kind of, I suppose, behavioral elements either. I think it's fine. You know, so. well, it's, I mean, it's not about necessarily what's bringing them together, whether it is the kind of the passion of lifting weights or it's the passion of golf or whatever it is. But if these, if there is that community and it's not being served and they all like the same things and then suddenly you're bringing them together under one banner, which is one brand, like, is, is that the piece here that, that actually they tapped? Yeah, into? I, I think, yeah, I, I think it is. That's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, as a summary, yes. And I, and I think, I don't know, again, if um, you, uh, Paul, or your listeners are spending any time on, on TikTok yourselves, I'm thinking about how that algorithm does so well at picking up what you're into because you spend an extra millisecond hovering on a piece of content. It very quickly learns what you you find entertaining. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? There are a number of creators in that space, content creators that are in very unusual niches. And I'm sure, <laughs> like, you know, um, around things that you're really into and i suppose what's interesting there some of those interests that you have there's a product or a service that can come to service more and satisfy the need of a consumer to consume something in that space and that's where the opportunity i think jim shot closed down there was a there was an element of of that but also i think what's interesting for a thing that we we were conscious of and i'm really proud of actually is that um, up until when I suppose Gymshark came around, the weight training area of gyms was actually relatively small compared to the cardio areas. And also the female usage of that space in the gym was was very low. It was an overtly male space. And I think, I don't know if you go into a, a gym now, you'll find it's a much more balanced um, environment, men and women. Uh, it's, uh, I think also in terms of age range, that's that's different. And also when you look at the percentage of space that's given to functional training now, weight training versus cardio, that's grown significantly and that's i think gem shark definitely had a like was the co a causal effect of those changes giving you know cons consumers that perhaps didn't have that confidence to enter that space because it can be a bit intimidating when you see very large and in shape guys doing their squats and lifts and stuff like that you know and i remember being delighted as sort of like you know hiding in plain sight as a, a gym shark advisor employee and watching young men and women enter that space on the beginning of their journey you know yes. wearing gym yes. shark you know it was absolutely delightful I think that's it echoes another brand which we talk about a lot on this is is Lululemon, you know, probably yeah. the most successful athletic leisure or athletic brand before Gymshark came out. And the trend is similar, is that their trend was yoga. And they were able to kind of capitalize on this community that was forming that actually they could become the spokespeople for and they can be the mechanic that are now. Yeah, and it sort of trickles down from the early adopters, doesn't it? Because a friend jumps first and then you see that they're perhaps they are looking in better shape. They're having their actually mental health is better. That perhaps, you know, you, you from the outside again, you look at them and you think, actually, there is something in this. And then suddenly again, you can bring by osmosis uh, a bit of virality and other people then saying, oh, what, what what's going on? Yeah, you know, actually, you know, a lot of misconception for women in particular was weight training would make you overtly muscly and masculine looking, which which it doesn't. And actually, again, that was, I suppose, we, we would look at sort of, you know, and, and we knew that. And obviously bringing that message and really educating target audience around that so actually you know removing that fear of of, of of training in that way yeah and so are you saying that that trend was happening anyway and you were able to capitalize on it or actually Gymshark were integral to no that? I don't think it was I think um it may have been but we the, the Gymshark brand absolutely turbocharged it and accelerated it for sure yeah that's amazing oh, that's yeah. incredible um 
I, you said something there which has also really stood out there is that you were in the lines asking people what were in their handbags it's that obsessiveness around deeply understanding your target niche which like that's the thing for me that you said well, all of these things that set that set Tim shock above there are so few brands to do that they never speak to the customers they never pick up the phone they never yeah it's a really interesting that. question actually and maybe for your listeners um if you've got sort of merchants listening and actually even if you're a b2b supplier actually no I'm, i'll retract that it's mainly in the direct to consumer space particularly on e-commerce you go into a, a meeting for a foul the first time you say what's the name of your uh biggest spender customer i've only had out of asking that question a hundred times two ish three merchants tell me the name and that is, and you, and I suppose, interestingly, if you were B2B, which we know are much more long and personal sales cycles, you would have a good understanding of that. Also, if you're in a physical retail store, so if brand was in a shop, you would know, hang on, this individual comes back very frequently. It's always here. They spend the most money and you probably could recall what they look like, actually what they wear when they're not wearing your product or using it. You'd know what car they turned up in. You'd be looking out the window. That is the thing that sort of suppose, direct degree e-commerce retail is rubbish at that kind of human connection of understanding your customer. So proactively spending time on doing it. So again, as a takeaway for, for, for listeners would be, you know, go and talk. First of all, find out who your top 10, 20 customers are. And as a senior leadership team, contact them somehow, Get, pick up the phone, meet them, go for a coffee, buy them a pizza and learn everything about them, um, what they like, what they don't like. You know, and that will really help you, I think. I, I love that. And I'd take that a little bit further because it's very similar. I run workshops with hundreds of people now and asking the same question was the last time you picked up the phone and spoke to a customer. And you get maybe one person put their hand up six months ago. We're like, oh, we've got a we've got a, a, a data research team. They do uh, yeah. various different things on that. Um, and actually, I think it's something they should do every week. Every week you should set out aside an hour for everyone in the company, not just the the leadership team, to then call one person, talk to them about what it was that made them get into that call. What was it that made them make that order? What do they like? Yeah, I mean, we um, who do they follow? As part of that RFM analysis mentioned at the top of the uh, uh, top of the uh, meeting with you, uh, you know, when you you can bucket people in to the very best, like the the highest spending groups, and actually, you know, again with tools like Clavio or others you can then set up a flow so that those that information is passed to whoever in the business to say here are the here's the people you need to talk to this week it can be automated right uh, and also these people are at risk of lapsing out of that group pick up the phone or actually here's people who have just joined it and and you'd also argue to some degree we used to do quite a bit of work on this as well like <clears throat> checking in personally with like nursery customers so that's that one purchase so one of the other things i would bring to bear is that a lot of brands assume that your customer trusts you implicitly after that first purchase. I mean, how many times have you had like a, you know, would refer refer a friend or, you know, um, uh, score us on Trustpilot, like the minute you've ordered the product, you know, like, hey, refer hasn't a friend and get to it. And you're like, hasn't even arrived yet. And actually not even <laughs> as it hasn't arrived. I've not even used it. So like that timing is so important. And that nursery period with a customer to, to again, understand who are they, what's going on, what are you doing right and wrong. That first interaction is absolutely key, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's vital. I'm just asking the right questions. Rich, this has been amazing. Um, obviously, you've had incredible CV, incredible career through that. You're now, now the, the chief growth officer at the Growth Foundation. Like new products coming out. Where can people find you to learn more? And have yeah, a chat? so LinkedIn. Um, obviously, I'm, I would say trying to get better at being more visible and creating more content there, but you'll find me relatively easily. Yeah, Richard Chappell. Um, the growth dot foundation is our URL um, and you'll be able to see everything we're doing consulting talent and there's also uh, links to our I say burgeoning applications uh, and software um, products that we you know again taking all the knowledge we've had over the last 20 30 years for myself but I've got a team of 20 growth Avengers pulling that all together and finding the things that um, mean that you know merchants and brands can grow while they're sleeping um, and order rescue is the first in that so yeah that's a phenomenal tool um, go and check it out it's driving sort of two, two to four percent uh order volume increase every day when, when it switched on um just from that checkout um work that it's doing um so that, yeah that that would be um that, that's where to find us and look forward to hearing from you richard trappel it's been a pleasure thanks for coming on building brand advocacy no problem thanks paul